Hi, I'm Jan Holden. I'm a professor at the University of North Texas uh, in counseling. I've been studying near-death experiences since my um, doctoral dissertation in the mid-1980s, and it's been a source of um, not only fascination, but uh, very deep inspiration uh, to work with NDEers and um, learn more about this fascinating topic and its implications. So um, I'm introducing myself to give Debbie a, um, a little help. And um, my topic for today is, um, for this hour, is spontaneous mediumship experiences, which is a term that my uh, colleague Ryan and I uh, coined. And uh, Ryan is not here, yeah, um, and so, but I wanted to credit him because we were very much partners in this uh, study. And uh, he is a professor of counseling at the University of Mary, at Marymount University in Virginia. Um, so, uh, oh, and I don't want to forget to say, uh, if you just arrived at the conference and you haven't turned off your cell phone yet, please do that. And um, if you want to have side conversations during the presentation, please, that's fine, but please take it out into the hall so that people can hear and it also doesn't interfere with the live streaming process. So, um, people appearing. What we know about NDEs from 40 years of research is that maybe one in five people who survive a close brush with death uh, report an experience during the close brush that they perceive to be real or hyper-real, of uh, their consciousness functioning usually apart from their physical body, perceiving the material world, uh, perceiving and interacting with transmaterial domains and entities like deceased loved ones, spiritual entities. And uh, most of these uh, experiences are predominantly pleasurable, profoundly pleasurable, but some are distressing. Maybe, we're just really guessing here, maybe 10% are uh, predominantly distressing. And um, they range from being simple, having you know one or two features, to very complex with numerous features uh, very, um, that the person per experiences to be very profound. And so um, regarding after effects, uh, in general, the more complex, uh, the deeper the NDE, the more and more intense the after effects. And one way to categorize the after effects is uh, psychological, um, such as changes in values in the direction of uh, things like less materialism and greater compassion, greater uh, valuing, sense of and valuing of unity with others and with the world and the cosmos. Um, spiritual after effects, including a, a sense of ongoing connectedness to the spiritual domain that the person to which most people were introduced in their NDE. Um, and um, um, care, um, capacities such as uh, telepathy, clairvoyance, precognition, uh, which is knowing what's going to happen in the future, um, and uh, physical changes like um, some end ears need less sleep, uh, find they can't eat meat anymore, um, are very sensitive to um, uh, pr uh, drugs or uh, other environmental um, kinds of things, and also uh, electrophys um, electrical after effects where um, electrical things malfunction in their presence. Um, one of the things you might do is you're here at the conference is just when you meet somebody, notice whether or not they're wearing a watch. And if they're not, there's a good chance that they're an ND ear. And if they are, they're not. Um, and social, um, people tend to change um, friend groups, uh, change marital partners. Um, because of the other changes, uh, they really um, return with different values, different goals in life, and they're in some ways not the same person that they were before the NDE, and that has repercussions in their social worlds. Um, and 
these after effects can manifest as spiritual emergence, which is sort of the kinder, gentler, gradual kind of thing, or spiritual emergency where the person is immediately profoundly transformed and it just rocks their world. And so, um, so the, the after effects can, can range from being very manageable to very overwhelming. Um, so, um, spontaneous mediumship experiences, is this term that we've coined, uh, refers to um, spontaneous after-death communication. So this is a subset of after-death communication, or ADC, which my um, doctoral former doctoral student, now Dr. Jenny Streithorn, uh, did a systematic review of all research on after-death communication that had been published between the late 1800s and uh, into the 2000s, and um, really established for the first time empirically based estimates of various phenomena related to ADC, like how many people sometime in their life um, have an, or at least say that they have had an after-death communication experience, and things like that came out of her research. So um, ADCs uh, most usually occur spontaneously without any um, expectation or um, um, foreknowledge by the person. Um, so for example, um, the person might be, um, in fact, later today, um, a, um, my co-presenter and I will be talking about um, a case study in which a man had a sleep ADC um, in which he saw his deceased wife. Um, and um, the living person, the spontaneous mediumship experiencer, uh, senses the presence of a discarnate, which is the word that I use for a deceased person. And the discarnate communicates to the living person um, something that they want um, to be conveyed to another person. Um, oh, I'm sorry, in ADC, there's direct communication. The, like in the case I just mentioned, the, the man, the um, ADCer, um, got a sense of a message from his wife. So the message is from the discarnate to the living person, and the message is meant for the living person. Unlike ADC, in spontaneous mediumship experience, the discarnate is maybe less likely to be a loved one, might even be a complete stranger. And um, the discarnate conveys a message not for the sme -er themselves, but they want the sme -er to convey the message to another person. So the sme -er becomes, instead of the recipient of the message, they become a medium of communication to, uh, between the discarnate and a third party. In the professional literature, um, the Bill, and Jude, Bill Guggenheim and Judy Guggenheim uh, um, describe some cases of this, but they didn't, of course, call it spontaneous. There hasn't been a term for this phenomenon that we were able to find in the, in the literature, but the phenomenon has been described, kind of like NDEs. They actually were described in the professional literature before Moody coined the term NDE. Um, the Guggenheims found uh, four cases out of about 300 accounts in their uh, book, Hello from Heaven, which, by the way, is the book that after Jenny did all that research and she read everything there was to read on ADC, I said to her one day, if somebody comes up to you and says, I just want to read one book to help me learn about ADC, what would you read? She said, Hello from Heaven by Bill Guggenheim and Judy Guggenheim. Um, and those were all adult mediums. Then Louis Legrand, in his 1997 book, found three cases, or described three cases of what he called third-party contacts out of about 70 cases in the book. One was a child, two were adult. And the reason I'm talking about this is that um, he thought that maybe um, these phenomena are more common for children, but actually in the cases that I found it, it wasn't particularly more common with children. Um, Ken Ring um, published a very interesting article back in 2008 in which a veteran paramedic um, became a spontaneous medium for Tom Sawyer, who was a, a fairly well-known near-death experiencer. Um, 
And uh, Michelle Knight, in her qualitative study of ADC in Sydney, Australia, uh, found two of her 21 participants, uh, which in qualitative research are called co-investigators. Co um, one was a child, one was an adult. Um, so um, one of the questions about spontaneous mediumship, just like with NDEs and other transpersonal phenomena, is how veridical are they? How accurate are the things that people perceive in, um, in the experience? And um, there's a great story um, in, uh, at the Enderf website of, from Ramona, who is a near-death experiencer. And so this, I'm going to read to you, it's not very long, what happened to her, um, and this was uh, some years after her NDE. She said, my brother-in-law then died in 2000. He did not believe in an afterlife. I was on the phone with my sister, who lived in Walnut Creek, California. All at once, I only could see yellow, like someone put a yellow sheet of paper in front of my eyes. Then it was gone, and in my den it was filled with bubbles, thousands of bubbles. This kept happening, the color yellow, then gone, thousands of bubbles, then gone. Then I had a voice in my head saying, tell her, tell her, tell her. It became so loud I couldn't even hear my sister anymore. So I interrupted her, and I said, Marcia, I have to tell you something. It makes no sense. I'm not crazy, but I have to tell you, yellow bubbles. She couldn't believe it. She was happy, so happy. She then told me that one night before her husband, Bob, died, they were watching a movie called Houdini. Bob was making a comment about there being no afterlife. So Marcia told him she would think of a secret word known only to each of them, and whoever went first, if there was an afterlife, to somehow get the secret word to the one left here. To my surprise, that was their secret words, yellow bubbles. She picked them because it made no sense, and nobody would ever just blurt out those words unless one of them were telling them to. So it's a veridical, spontaneous mediumship experience. In this case, the nde -er was the medium. Um, I actually had a, an experience of, of, of veridical, spontaneous mediumship. Um, I, I have studied induced after-death communication where a counselor facilitates a, a grieving client to have an experience of after-death communication in an effort to help the client uh, with their grief. And so after I, I took three of my students up to Chicago and we trained with Al Botkin, who um, discovered or developed this technique. And then when we came back to the Dallas area, we met uh, every couple of weeks for a few months and practiced on each other So before we let ourselves loose on our clients. So um, one day, uh, it was my turn to be the sitter. And Jenny, who actually did the study on after-death communication subsequently, was my um, counselor. And because we'd done this several times before, I was getting kind of low on my list of dead people that I wanted to contact. So, yeah. So I thought of my cousin David, who died shortly after returning from the Vietnam War. So it was quite a while ago. And um, he was my favorite cousin, um, just a really um, sweet, kind, contactful, um, caring sort of person. I just really, really adored him. And, um, and so I said, you know, maybe I'd like to connect with David. And, um, and so we did the technique which involves eye movement desensitization and reprocessing. And that's, so Jenny does this with her fingers, I watch. And the, the theory is that it somehow sort of um, gets the two sides of the brain equally stimulated, which uh, maybe opens the person to um, input that is of a more transpersonal nature. And so she does this. I close my eyes, and there is David in my mind's eye. And of course, well, he died from a car. He was in a car going over a railroad crossing, and the train came and hit the car. So his body was very mangled. But as I saw him, he was absolutely in the prime of life, healthy, and 
Um, there were no words or even specific thoughts exactly. What we looked at each other and in that look was just absolute love and appreciation for each other and joy of, <clears throat> of seeing each other again. And that lasted maybe 30 seconds and completely un, I, the thought never crossed my mind. His father, my uncle Ray, came in and literally elbowed his way in front of David and held out his hand and in his hand was an hourglass. And again, without thoughts, without words, without anything, I knew that he wanted me to contact my Aunt Norma. Now, my, my Uncle Ray had just died a couple of years before this, um, this practice session, and he had died from eye cancer, and so, you know, there was disfigurement and stuff, but again, he appeared completely whole and healthy. And I knew that he wanted to, me to contact my still-living Aunt Norma and tell her um, that I had seen him and tell her about this hourglass. So I don't get this at all. Like, what is this? What's with this? And the hourglass didn't have any sand in it, just like this one. There's no sand, but it's meant to sit in a table, clear glass, you know, shaped that way. And, um, and like, I'm not getting it. So I try to, in my mind's eye, I try to zoom in. Like, maybe if I see it closer, I'll, like, get it. And when I did, it disappeared. And so I returned to my original position, it reappeared. And I thought, well, I'll try a different angle. So I went to get around and look at it. It disappeared. And when I got back to where I was originally, it reappeared. It's like, this is all you get. You know, call Norma and tell her this. Well, I want to tell you that I was never close to my aunt. She's a great woman. But I just, she was just an aunt that I never got. And I was actually never close to my Uncle Ray either. Um, and so the idea of just calling her, I hadn't probably talked to her in 25, 30 years, and just calling her out of the blue saying, hi, Aunt Norma, you know, this is your niece, Jan, and I haven't talked to you for 30 years, but I'm just calling to tell you, I saw Ray in a vision, and he wanted me to tell you an hourglass. Like, right, I'm going to do that. So much longer story shorter, I did eventually call her and told her about it. And when I got to the end of the story, I said, so, you know, I don't know what this hourglass thing means. I'm, I'm just telling you what I saw. And she said, oh, I know exactly what it means. I said, you do? And she said, yeah. She said, I'm looking at them right now. And I said, them? And she said, yeah. She said, when I was a little girl, I used to go visit my grandmother. And I was bored. And this was in the days before TV. My grandmother had these two cut crystal vases. And she kept them on an end table on a glass shelf. So when I was bored, I'd get, lay down on the floor on my back, and I'd scoot up under this table, and I'd watch the sun glint through these two cut crystal vases. It was so beautiful, the colors and the brilliance and all that. So when my grandmother died, I wanted only two things from her estate, those two vases. They're sitting on my dining room table right now. She said, I'm looking right at them. And she said, what Ray knew is if we like woke up in the middle of the night and the house was on fire and we had to quick jump out of bed and run out, I would stop and pick up those two cut crystal vases. They're the two material things that I value most in the world. She said, the thing is, they're different shapes, but they're both wide at the top and then they get narrow and then they're wide at the bottom. Clear glass, no sand in them, meant to sit on a table. The hourglass represented a shape that really you know, fit both of them. And she said, nothing you could have told me would convince me more <laughs> that he's waiting for me. So when my aunt died, my cousins and I had a very heartfelt conversation about knowing where uh, that Ray and Norma are unite reunited. So that was a veridical uh, SME. I didn't ask for it. Ray appeared. Um, you know, without my even having thought of him and wanted me to convey this message to someone else and it turned out to be exactly the kind of thing that was um, convincing to them that I had actually seen Ray. So, um, the literature on SMEs as an NDE after effect, um, we really didn't find any major studies. Um, we looked in uh, some recent books, the uh, PMH Atwater's uh, Big Book of Near-Death Experience, no mention of it. Um, 
Yvonne Kaysen's book, Farther Shores, which is my favorite book about um, understanding after effects. And um, even the book that I was lead editor for, and Bruce uh, worked closely with me, um, that re covered research for the first 30 years of the field, um, we didn't you know, have any, there's no mention of it in that book. Um, so um, in 2008, an NDE -er came to talk with me and kind of consult about her experiences. Her name is Janie. She, uh, she was a young adult at the time. She had had an NDE during physical unconsciousness from an acute life-threatening illness. And um, her NDE had both material, meaning she's observing the material world from a position outside her body, and transmaterial, um, interacting with um, environments and entities beyond the material world. Um, and a few days after her NDE, she had her first visitation from a disembodied person. And uh, she said, I was in bed about to fall asleep when I felt someone come in the room. It felt like a female and I thought it was my mom. But when I opened my eyes and looked around for her, no one was there. I thought that my imagination was running wild, but it turned out that this same woman followed me around here and there for four years. And since then, Janie has had numerous visitations from disembodied persons, usually between two and four in the morning. She says that's for, somehow for her a very active time. And at, since at doing this study, I've actually stumbled onto other people mentioning the middle of the night being a very like, um, likely time to have experiences like this. And uh, Janie said, I would say that about five out of every 10 visitations I get include a message. At that point, the fact that I've received a message almost becomes more distressing than the visitation itself, because I wonder what I'm supposed to do with the message, especially if it's for someone that she doesn't know. You know, you go knock on somebody's door and say, oh, excuse me, you don't know me, but I just saw your you know, deceased fill in the blank, and they wanted me to tell you X. So uh, some recent examples that Janie gave, uh, she had a friend, Rob, who had died the previous year. And Janie says, I was out with a group of people and could feel Rob there in the room with us. Standing next to me was one of his dear friends that he worked with, someone who I'd only met once before. Rob wanted me to give him a message. Without hesitation, I leaned over and told him that Rob was there with us, and I gave him the message, and he loved it. He was shocked, but he loved it. He knew it was from Rob and not from me. In that case, it was the right thing to do, and I felt that without question in my heart when I did it. Uh, she said, however, um, most of the situations were not so straightforward and easy to handle. She said, one that's causing me difficulty right now is someone who passed four years ago. I never met him, but we have several mutual friends. He wants me to help his wife, and he's a musician, and he also wants to channel music through me, and he can be pushy and draining. Yeah. So, um, again... We researched the literature, but found nothing. Now, I will say in, uh, in the interim, <clears throat> I've just published an article about, on this uh, study. And Ken Ring, uh, who's a veteran near-death uh, near researcher who is um, retired, but obviously still active, uh, emailed me and pointed out that he had uh, reported on a case of this in, uh, in his book, Heading Toward Omega. And, um, but again, um, didn't have a name for it, or it's, it's like it wasn't known as a thing exactly. But um, he pointed out correctly that I overlooked at least an example that existed in the literature. Um, anyway, in talking with other NDEers, Janie said she found that NDEers are so humbled by this gift and have such a high feeling of moral obligation about what the right thing or wrong thing is to do with the messages that we don't fully develop it and it causes stress. We could surely exploit it and make some money from it, but it just doesn't feel right, so we sit with it in private. For me, there's also tension in developing it further because it feels like developing a psychic gift is possibly a distraction from spirituality. So it's an inner tension. What do I do with these things? Do I um, try to develop this or try to um, reduce it from happening um, are the kinds of things that she struggled with. And in talking with 
so she went on and even talked with professional mediums. One of the things she found is those who hadn't had NDEs seemed defensive as if she represented professional competition, and that wasn't what she was about at all. Uh, but from those willing to help, she found useful information and strategies for regulating and dealing with these SMEs, um, including ways to protect herself or just uninvite them and um, other kinds of things that um, helped her regulate it all. So some of the themes from Janie and other SMEers with whom we've talked um, are that they struggle with the morality of whether, when, and how to share messages with the living people for whom the messages were intended, and coping with holding messages when they haven't delivered them, and finding strategies to regulate even the occurrence of SMEs, and then wrestling with the tension between psychic and spiritual development. So we had a lot of questions. Um, how, what is the incidence of SMEs both prior to and following an NDE. In Janie's case, she'd never had this experience before her NDE, and then it just happened overwhelmingly. Um, but how typical is that? Um, how frequent, uh, you know, if they do have SMEs before or after, how many have they had? And the relationship between the incidence of SME and the depth of their near-death experience, we wondered if there was a relationship there. Maybe, maybe deeper the NDE, the more likely they are to have SMEs, we wondered. Um, and the extent to which people feel distressed by SMEs, and if they do feel distressed, um, their help-seeking behavior and, and whether they've found helpful strategies to, to cope with them. So um, we did a survey, and so we recruited participants primarily through IANS, 45 local groups. As you may know, um, IANS has um, community-based groups throughout the U.S., and the organization has a network whereby a researcher can, uh, once research is approved, um, contact the coordinator, who right now is Bob Cyrus, and then he gets the word out to the group leaders, and then they send the research invitations to their um, um, email lists and announce it in the meetings and so forth. And we also um, did some online recruitment and, um, and ended up with an email invitation for people to participate in this online survey. Uh, we defined what SMEs are, and we asked participants if they were over 18, English speaking, and had or may have had an NDE, whether or not they had experienced an SME. And we, so we made the point that we really wanted anybody who either had or thought they might have had an NDE to participate in our study, and we would worry about whether they really had an NDE, and we wanted people both who did and didn't remember ever having had an SME because that helps us know, you know, how many people don't have this experience uh, despite having had an NDE. So um, we had a 38-item instrument. First we asked demographic questions, and then we gave the NDE scale that Bruce Grayson first published in 1983 is now the widest, most widely used um, instrument in NDE research that assesses the um, the presence and depth of the experience, and um, asked them how many SMEs they had before their NDE, how many they had after, and um, then those who had had SMEs answered 13 questions, um, some with multiple parts, to tell us about the, the nature of their experiences. So a response rate. Um, 146 people accessed the informed consent form. This is online. Uh, four did not endorse it, so that's as far as they went. They didn't continue. 28 endorsed it, but then didn't proceed with the rest of the questionnaire. 15 endorsed it, but completed only the demographics. And 10 completed everything, but scored below 7 on the NDE scale, which is the industry standard for feeling confident that what the person had was an NDE. And uh, so what that left us with was 89 complete response sets. And um, of these 89 people, 65% were male, 35% female, and I commented on this in my last presentation that 
there's really no difference in NDEs uh, occurring between men and women. Probably this reflects more that women tend to volunteer for research more than men do. Ages ranged from 20 to 17 years. Uh, average age was 53. Um, ethnicity um, was mostly white, non-Latina, or Latino. I'm sorry, I went past that very fast. So you can just see it was mostly white, um, non-Latina, or Latino. And then um, education level. Um, it, was a, it was a pretty well-educated group. Uh, you know, with um, most people having at least some college, um, some bachelor's work. And then the year of their NDE, um, you can see it's pretty evenly distributed across the, um, the decades. So before 1970 and then 71 to 80 and so forth, it, it's, there's not too much variance, so they're, they're pretty equally distributed across the decades. Circumstances, um, almost half illness or health crisis, uh, a third injury, 5% suicide attempt. I don't know if that, if that doesn't add up to 100, it's because there was somebody, some people said other. Oh, there it is, 16% <laughs> said other, and actually we think if we went in, we could probably categorize many of those into the previous ones, but we didn't do that yet. Um, so our results were, we asked, before your first NDE, did you experience an SME? And 85% of people said no, 15% said yes. So some people have SMEs even before their NDEs, but not the majority. It's for most people there what I call SME virgins, yeah. After your first NDE, did you experience an SME? And out of those who reported no pre-NDE, so this is just that 85% up there, half, about half said no, but half said yes. So a, a big number of people started having SMEs after their NDE, about half of people who had not had an SME before um, had one after. So that's a pretty good um, number of people. Um, so then looking at the people who had had SMEs uh, before and after their NDEs, um, the people who had no SME either before or after their NDE, uh, their mean NDE uh, scale score was about 16. And um, no SME before their NDE, but at least one afterwards, their score was a bit higher. And having an SME, at least one before, but none after, was also even higher than that. However, that there were only three people in that category. So statistically, that's, we can't do anything with that. Like it could have been really an unusual um, three people. And at least one SME before and after the NDE uh, was about 17.3. So what we did was um, we focused just on the people who reported no pre-NDE SMEs. And those are the ones we're mostly interested in. If you didn't have this experience before your NDE, did you have it afterwards? And what we found was that um, the SMEers had um, significantly higher NDE scale scores than non-SMEers, and uh, the more complex and deeper the NDE um, was um, related to the um, presence of SME with a medium effect. So then the frequency of retrospectively reported SMEs. So now we know who has had at least one. Now we want to know how many exactly did you have. And so what this means is before their first or only NDE, um, the people who'd had one before their NDE had only, 30% had only one, 20% had 
between two and five. 10% had six to 10. Nobody had 11 to 20. And then the group that had more than 20 was like 40%. So there's a tendency for people to have only one or a few or to be like mediums and have lots of these experiences. After their first or only NDE, 17% had one, 35% um, had two to five, 11% um, had six to 10, uh, about four to 5% had 11 to 20, and 33% had um, more than 20. So you see that not only the um, presence, but the, ins the number, the frequency of those is higher. Uh, for uh, appears to be higher for people after their first or only NDE. And then we asked, how distressing have your SMEs been? And this was interesting, because of course Janie would have said very, but she was um, is in the minority. Um, about a third people said not at all, 17% said mm, slightly, 21% said moderately, and only 4% said very or extremely. So um, most people were not um, seriously distressed by these experiences. Um, but we did have 28% uh, who didn't answer, and of course we don't know why. And then did you ever seek help to manage or cope with your SMEs? And 45% uh, said no, 28% said yes, and again, 27% didn't answer. We don't know why. Um, and the, of those who did um, seek help, did, have you found at least one strategy that helped you cope? 11% said no. That's a group that concerns us, right? These are people who are distressed by these experiences and haven't found any way to help themselves. Um, but 62% said yes, they would found ways to manage or cope, and 27% didn't answer. And then from where did you learn the helpful strategies? And this was interesting. 66% um, of people just said personal experience. It was just kind of trial and error. They sort of figured out ways to manage or cope with the experiences. 7% uh, said by talking with another NDE ear either through direct communication or reading something that someone had written. And um, a little bit from non-NDE or mediums, 3%. But from mental health professionals, a big goose egg. Um, and if you were here at my previous presentation, knowing that there's um, a fairly good propensity for health professionals to respond unhelpfully and harmfully to even disclosure of a near-death experience. Imagine disclosing, you know, I see dead people. So probably there's not even a lot of seeking of help from mental health professionals. And 14% said other sources, and we haven't dug into the, those responses to find out exactly what they're referring to there. And some said all of the above. So, um, so maybe in that 10%, there might have been a health professional somewhere who helps somebody. We can hope. So, summary. Uh, first of all, of course, our study is limited. We sampled only NDEers who are tech savvy, you know, answering a questionnaire online. We sampled those who are involved in NDE groups or seeking NDE information online, not the massive NDEers out there who aren't involved in those things. Um, there was substantial attrition. You know, I think 147 people accessed, but only 89 uh, completed. Um, but e even considering those limitations, at least we know a little bit more than, than we used to about the, um, about the nature of this experience. So we have some recommendations for healthcare professionals working with NDEers, um, including in the immediate NDE aftermath, preparing NDEs for possible after effects, including SMEs, and how to cope with them. So if someone has had a near-death experience, maybe I wouldn't um, say this 
the next thing, you know, after they t first tell me their NDE, there's a lot to, for them to process. But at some point, um, I might uh, broach the topic that, um, you know, NDEers um, often report after effects, and usually the more sort of complex or deep the NDE, the more after effects, um, but you, you can never tell. A, a relatively straightforward NDE might have profound after effects and vice versa, but there's this tendency for the deeper the NDE, the more the after effects. And um, among other things, one of the after effects that um, about half of NDEers say is that um, never experienced before um, feeling the presence of a deceased person who had a message that they wanted the person to communicate to somebody else. You know, m most NDEers say they've never had that experience before the NDE, but about half say that they've had at least one episode of that after the NDE. So it's something just to be aware of that that can happen, and um, uh, but also that most NDEers who do have this experience say that it doesn't bother them very much. Um, sometimes it can be problematic for some people, and certainly if it if it is for you, come back and we'll talk. Um, um, but um, broaching this uh, that subject um, might be helpful to prepare people for the the possibility and actually reduce the likelihood that they're upset by it. Um, in the long-term aftermath, identifying what after effects, including SMEs, the NDE -er has experienced and the degree of coping with their after effects. So um, if I was talking to someone years after their NDE, I might broach that subject um, a little sooner in our discussion. Um, and uh, psychoeducation for NDEers, they, they need to be aware that although SMEs are not universal among NDEers, they appear to be common. So NDEers should be prepared that they might experience them even if they never had before, and especially if their NDE was relatively deeper, they're more likely to have the experience. And those who've had SMEs need to be prepared for the possibility that they may or may not find them distressing but only the very outside possibility that they'll find them extremely distressing. And those who've had SMEs should know that if they seek help for their SMEs, they're not alone, and they likely will find at least some help, most likely, um, actually what I should say there is most likely from their own experience, sort of trial and error, but also other NDEers, and maybe, hopefully, increasingly from health professionals. And for further research, um, it would be very interesting to be able to study veridical uh, spontaneous mediumship experiences. And these people provide an opportunity to, um, to study the phenomenon of veridical transpersonal experiences, um, those where um, the, the, media, the NDE -er, um, gets a message that means nothing to them but when they convey it to the living person, it means everything to them. And that kind of thing is uh, very evidential for the, um, the um, survival of consciousness hypothesis. So we have, um, I think, 10 or 15 minutes. If you have questions, comments, or if anyone has had a, a spontaneous mediumship experience uh, and would like to share it with the group, I think, um, um, audiences tend to be interested in those kinds of experiences, so uh, feel free to step forward, and if you do have a question or an experience to share, uh, come up to the microphone. Yeah, because no one else is uh, coming up to the microphone, I will. Thank you. Um, this afternoon I'll be speaking about the science of the afterlife and mediumship, because um, I had my near-death experience 45 years ago, um, but I work as a medium all the time now, mm -hmm. um, and it took a long time. <clears throat> Excuse me. It took a long time to get into it, hmm. but I've spent 10 years studying mediumship now. Mm -hmm. and what, what, what made it take a long time for you? Um, well, I had it in 1970, mm -hmm. and after 33 days in the hospital, my orthopedic surgeon ran in one day, put me in a wheelchair, threw my clothes in my lap, 
took me down the freight elevator and out the back door, and my mom was had the car running so that they wouldn't put me in the nut house. Huh. Okay. It started there, and then you guys finally formed your organization um, in 1978, mm-hmm. and I discovered it about 1985 and looked at it very suspiciously for a long time and joined in 1997. And I finally started coming to your conventions about four years ago. Hmm. Um, and now I'm on board, but um, it took a long time. Mm-hmm. But I will be talking about the science of both the NDE and mediumship as mm-hmm. one subject, mm-hmm. which is what we were doing in our the video that Lewis and I put out last year, mm-hmm. which you can now buy as a, a CD over here. But it's um, taken a long time, and it was always there, but you can't bring it out. Sorry. Mm-hmm. And when you find it, do it's amazing. Yeah. But and so I, I'm very uh, evidential. Yeah. In what I do, and sometimes I'll be in front of a spiritualist church, and I'll bring five um, spirits through for three sitters. I'll have their name. Their this is your grandma. Her name's Elizabeth. This is your aunt Martha on her daughter, and then on the other side of your family, I have Aunt Carla, and I will I'll bring that kind of stuff through like that, and. The, it's not me doing it, it's them doing it. The, the yeah. odds of the things that I, when I run the statistics on it, it's 320 billion to one. Yeah. I can't guess this stuff, yeah. and it just comes flowing through. Yeah. Well, at first it's terribly scary. Hmm. You don't, you don't want to have to do with it. Hmm. <clears throat> but after a while you get used to it, and then you accept it, and then, mm-hmm. then you decide, okay, I'll go study mediumship, and I'll and I'll do all this, and mm-hmm. it's really a, a, a difficult thing because mm-hmm. it, it happens to you right away, but you can't do anything with it. You can't, you can't tell anybody. I mean, I'm yeah. a physics student at college, right? <laughs> and, and they're all talking Newtonian physics, and I'm, uh, I'm seeing people, you know, forget yeah. it. <laughs> right, right, So I just gotcha. wanted to share that. Yeah, thank you very much. And um, Julie Baichel and her husband uh, of the Winbridge Institute have done research on mediums as well and found, and they have actually a list of certified mediums, people who they've repeatedly had a sitter and called the medium on the phone and said, I have someone here, maybe don't even say if they're male or female, who recently lost someone and tell us about them. And then the medium starts, um, yeah, we just lost the microphone. The medium starts telling all this information and um, that is very specific, like you said, names and, um, you know, the person's stature and um, what they like to do and what they hated and all this kind of stuff that's very idiosyncratic, but is, um, but the sitter rates as, uh, you know, exactly on target. And there are some mediums who can do this uh, very regularly like yourself. And so, um, so the the research is um, is very um, um, supportive uh, that mediumship is a real thing. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Hi, Jan. Um, a previous uh, IANS board member, Gabe, teaches a course in uh, out of body experience, how you can leave your body at will, basically, and it speaks of meeting uh, spirits on the other side. And I was wondering if you could differentiate between what, uh, what they're doing and uh, what mediumship is about. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's interesting to try to categorize all these things because mediumship specifically has to do with a person serving as a medium of communication between a deceased or discarnate and a living person. Whereas um, just the idea of um, having out-of-body experiences in order to meet spiritual entities, there's no uh, like message to be communicated to somebody. So it's like a, a related but different thing. Mm. Yeah. Unless, unless you were sent on a mission to visit a specific person and bring back uh, a message. Yes, in, in which case then you are serving as a medium. That's yeah. what traditional... Um, uh, intentional mediumship is about the a, a sitter 
a living person wants information about or from a deceased or discarnate person, and the medium serves that purpose and is presumably skilled at being able to make that connection. Yeah. And also, uh, the people that, or the spirits that um, Gabe described as meeting were what you, uh, I guess, conventionally define as ghosts, whereas perhaps mediumship is reaching to a different plane or a different uh, level yeah. of spirit, so that they're no longer ghosts, but they still have the ability to communicate. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know how to comment on that. I don't know how to differentiate ghosts from discarnates. Um, I just, I don't know how. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. You're welcome. Thank you. Uh, maybe my comment or question will kind of piggyback actually off the last speaker. I'm a, I'm a colleague of Gabe Sereni uh, with the same organization, so a little bit of knowledge and background of that. But uh, <clears throat> first with my question, do you think that we might have a little bit of an inherent bias, even people that have had an NDE? and that we are conditioned from being in the physical body that even the most of what we're talking about in terms of mediumship has a directionality to it in, there, in the terms of from the you know, disincarnate extra physical world to the physical world as, as the primary uh, channel for communication. And the reason I say that is that the condition that we're in in this physical life oftentimes will carry over. And this kind of gets to that question of, of ghosts and stuff. So, you know, you can think of the range of spiritual maturity or um, from healthy to pathology within the physical dimensions is, if anything, amplified on the extra physical dimensions where you have, you know, the enlightened spirit guide that's no longer possessing a physical body all the way down to a very pathological and hurting and needing consciousness. And to get to my point is that I think that while there's certainly a very um, important role that a medium can facilitate in consoling the living and also pointing to this, the hypothesis you've mentioned of like this kind of continuing consciousness hypothesis, there is also likely an equal role back to where the kind of assistance that can be done to the disincarnate in terms of helping them a, realize their condition, and B, start to move on. And the case that you gave of the musician, for example, is case in point of someone that's trying to still connect and latch on to their physical, last previous physical life. Yes. It's not really serving anyone. Right, right. right? So there's mm -hmm. a lot of clarification that could possibly mm -hmm. be facilitated. It's like they, the medium is receiving this message. Now, whether or not they carry that message on, is it something that really needs to be con conveyed to the, to the spouse, or is it something that's mm -hmm. just giving the, the disincarnate some kind of peace of mind that they don't really need? They need to be disattaching from this. Yes, life. right, right. So part of what you're saying is that in addition to being um, potentially helpful to the living person, it might be helpful to the discarnate in terms of um, them achieving some kind of um, goal or purpose or investment that they had in in life, but also it could be that they're um, attached to physical existence in a way that's impeding them um, in their afterlife existence, yeah. yeah. And that's all, you know, I, I think it's all possible and, and interesting. We're certainly beyond the realm of um, research because, you know, the discarnates don't come back and fill out our questionnaires about, you sure. know, whether it was helpful when they did finally get their message across, right, you know, right. but, um, but I think it's a, you know, at, a, at another level, it's definitely something to be thinking about, about, you know, certainly using mediumship for the benefit of, um, of all, both the living and the discarnate. Absolutely. Yeah. And, uh, you know, coming from like the OBE background, you know, of course, like your first thing you think of, like, well, I'll go spy on my girlfriend, or you know what I mean, like these mm -hmm. kind of very material rooted things. But some of the more advanced projections end up being assistential in nature and not mm -hmm. always assisting mm -hmm. people that are incarnate, but uh, uh, the mm -hmm. disincarnate. Mm -hmm. And, and um, mm -hmm. there's a lot of corroboration, of course, not, you know, objectively verifiable, but yeah. a lot of corroborated uh, experiences of going to almost like extra physical clinics and helping the more pathological consciousness kind of regain some lucidity so that they can start to move mm -hmm. on. Yeah, yeah so. great, right, thank thanks. you. And we do, we just have two more minutes, so one more question. Hi. Hi, 
I just wanted to talk about my uh, spontaneous mediumship experience. Great. Um, I had my ND at age two, forgot about it, remembered it at age 50. So the first experience I had after that was with someone that I knew, but I didn't like him and I didn't really respect him. Mm. And he came to me and he said, I want you to tell my mother that I'm okay. Mm. So being the kind of person I was, I decided I would write a letter, you know, instead of calling this person. And, and that's what I did. Uh, but I really felt a compulsion. I could not rest until I gave that message. Hmm. And when I wrote the letter, I heard back from the mother and she says, that was just wonderful, you know, yeah. to be able to hear this. And I told the whole family. Yeah. So um, I, I, I haven't had one since then, hmm. but I have had experiences with uh, discarnate, um, not ghosts because I don't see them except in my mind's eye, but discarnate people, and I think this was mentioned, where they're tied to the earth in some way, and it's usually a very negative way. So someone came to me who had murdered his friend, someone else came to me who was burned in a fire, mm -hmm. and those people could not move on. Mm -hmm. And so I was able to help them. Mm -hmm. Thank you, very interesting. Yeah. Yes, go ahead. I think we have, do we have like a half a minute? Okay. Okay, so very interesting talk. I have just had an, an intuitive reading just a couple days ago. And in that intuitive reading, they told me that I needed to explore rapid eye therapy, which is what you were talking mm -hmm. about, where you I move uh, her. through that consciousness. Mm -hmm. And I'd never heard of it, and now all of a sudden twice in two days. So that means it's <laughs> validated, right? <laughs> um, but I think part of coming from an NED, uh, a near-death experience and moving forward into that mediumship realm is a fear, maybe, of bringing in something negative and not being able to cope or control that environment mm -hmm. as well as you know of course the materialistic world of viewing us as crazy mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. being locked up someday mm -hmm. but how maybe in your research in the future come up with some ways of coping techniques and how to avoid that negative realm mm -hmm. so that more people who are experiencing smes can feel like it's a great path for them Mm -hmm. And without yes. that fear. Yeah, and maybe we'll have that topic um, addressed this afternoon in the talk on mediumship. Yeah, thank you. All right, well, thank you very much for your attention. I appreciate it.